you. Thank you. You may be seated. They didn't tell me it was casual until last night after I got here, so today I wore my Urson Graduate School of Theology shirt. Uh, um, I'm going to pick up in a way uh, where I left off from last night, but uh, last night we read from Acts chapter 2, verse 42, so I'm just going to read that again today. In fact, I'll read through verse 47. I really spoke on it last night, but this will be the launching pad for today, and let me say it is great to be here. appreciate Brother Morgan for arranging this conference and also inviting me to be here. I think it's important for us to be able to examine who we are, what we believe, and what we're trying to accomplish. And preaching is great. Uh, we need preaching. We must have preaching. But there are times as ministers and other leaders that not only do we preach, but we have some sort of dialogue. We have some sort of discussion of what the scripture means and what we're supposed to be doing and uh, so that's what I tried to do last night at least to set the stage and we'll also have some questions and answers here today so there may be some things that you want to talk about but in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 it says and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together, had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so this is presented as the early church the first converts of the day of Pentecost, and how they lived. And it's presented as a positive role model for us today. Now, some of the details um, are different. We're not in Jerusalem. We're not all together in one city. Uh, We don't have all things in common. But the principles that you see in this passage, as I explained last night, I believe still apply to the church today. And we should expect to grow with the growth that comes from God. So I addressed this in part the last time, but I would like to ask more specifically today, uh, how can we function as an apostolic church in the 21st century? Culture has changed drastically. The thinking of people has changed drastically. And so what I'm going to talk about for a little while is a first century church in the 21st century. A first century church in the 21st century. Now let's look at where we are. Let's understand what we're dealing with. Contemporary culture, we can describe it as postmodern. And you've probably heard that, but if you're not sure what that means, let me just briefly explain. Uh, for the last couple of centuries, at least, the church has been battling what is known as modernism. Modernism says it puts a premium on rationality. It puts a premium on reason, on science. It says everything can be explained by what you see, by the scientific method. Uh, Everything is material. Of course, in the ultimate sense, that modernism leads to atheism and um, atheistic evolution, not believing in God. And so the pre-modern world believed in miracles. They believed in the Bible. They believed in God. The modern world says we don't need that. Even if you believe in it, it's okay as a personal choice, but it doesn't make any difference. We can explain everything through reason. Well, we've seen how that... Although, obviously, I think reason is very important. It's a component of our total makeup. We can't explain everything by human reasoning. And there are things that transcend human reasoning, such as God himself. And we can approach him through reason, but that's only one way we approach God. We engage him not only with our emotions, but with uh, not only with our reason, but with our emotions and ultimately our will. It's a decision, a choice by faith. Faith transcends reason. Faith is not unreasonable, but it's greater and bigger and goes higher than what reason can prove. Well, society has begun to realize that modernism, reason, can't do everything. After all, modernism, yes, it brought us scientific advancement. It also brought us the atomic bomb. It brought us World War I, brought us World War II. It's brought uh, such devastation greater I mean, Hitler and Nazism, that was an application of atheistic reason in a racist way. Um, 
the communists, Stalin and Mao, that was an application of atheistic reason in a social way. And we're still seeing the devastation that's caused by that. So people uh, more recently begin to say, no, science is not all the answer. Reason is not all the answer. So instead of turning to God, unfortunately, uh, in, in this first started in the universities this, and um, the literary community, philosophers, and now it's permeated throughout the culture of what is known as postmodernism, which means what they say is there is no absolute truth. Modernism tried to find absolute truth out there somewhere by human reasoning ability. Postmodernism says that's a failure. But in turning, instead of turning back to God, who is the answer, they decided, well, each culture has its own beliefs, has its own traditions, and each is equally valid. There is no absolute truth. So whatever is good for you is fine. Whatever is good for me is fine. Whether, whatever you want to believe is fine. Whatever I want to believe is fine. And that's the culture in which we live. Now, in the modern, under modernism, they might attack the Bible and say, well, the Bible's full of miracles and fairy tales and myths. You know, prove to me that Noah really lived and all that. Postmodern, they don't care. You want to believe the Bible? That's fine. If I want to believe Buddhism, that's fine. doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's, the Bible is true for you and Buddha is true for me or Islam or whatever I want to believe is true for me. And you see that in debates such as this whole idea of marriage. You know, in the modernist thought would be, there, you know, we can find what biologically, even if we didn't believe in God, we can find biologically and culturally and historically what is the absolute best way. Now they say whatever you want to do is fine. So if two homosexuals want to marry, that's okay. Two heterosexuals want to marry, that's okay. Three people want to get married pretty soon, that'll be okay. Because it doesn't matter. So that's postmodernism, which there is no absolute truth. <clears throat> and then, of course, we're facing secularism increasingly, where religion is irrelevant. Religion is removed from public discourse. And so in the school system, you can bring up any philosophy you want, but not Christianity. You can bring up any belief you want except the Bible. Uh, in the legal system, you can promote any doctrine or belief as long as you don't promote the Bible. Uh, see, postmodernism says it's so uh, tolerant. In fact, that's the supreme virtue is tolerance. Now, I believe in tolerance in the sense of we respect other people as human beings, as citizens, regardless of their lifestyle choices. Um, we don't disrespect them. We don't attack them. We don't belittle them. We treat them honestly and sincerely because they're people that are created in the image of God and they're people for whom Jesus Christ died. So we're not here to attack them from the pulpit or even in personal conversation. We're here to love them, respect them, befriend them. And even people who live in an immoral lifestyle, we can befriend them to a certain extent. We can, we can show respect and kindness. We can protect their civil rights. So there is a value in tolerance in that sense. But what, what postmodernism has redefined tolerance to mean is you must approve that our way is just as good as your way. So what I think a scriptural tolerance, if there is a Hindu community or a Buddhist community, I think a scriptural tolerance would be if they want to have their worship, let them have their worship, even though we feel like it's wrong. But... We uh, we respect their freedom of religion, just like we want them to respect our freedom of religion. But what postmodernism wants to say is, do you think the Hindus are saved? If you don't think they're saved, then you're you're a, a hate hate monger. Uh, do you think homosexuals are right? And they're saved and they're they have a right to do what they do. And it's good for them to do that. If you say no, then you're homophobic. You you preach a gospel of hate. You're creating an atmosphere that would entice, uh, incite violence against them. No, not at all. Just because we believe that something is right and something is wrong doesn't mean we're filled with hate. But you see, postmodernism attacks the very idea of truth. And in other words, they're tolerant of everybody except those who believe in truth. If you're willing to say everything is relative, you can join the club. 
But if you say there's an absolute truth and some things are absolutely right and will, some things are absolutely wrong and some things are wrong will never be right. If that's your belief, then they don't have tolerance for you. They want to shut down your free speech. They believe in free speech and, and the college campuses are the worst. They believe in free speech until it's politically incorrect. And then they will outlaw your right to speak. That's already happening in Europe and even in Canada, that you cannot publicly say homosexuality is a sin and quote the scripture for it. You can be fined and arrested because that's hate speech. That's happened in uh, Canada. Someone put an ad in the newspaper uh, to that effect, and they had to pay a large fine because they don't have the First Amendment of the Constitution in Canada. They don't have the absolute guarantee of freedom of speech, and so your speech is limited by what may offend people's feelings. So that's the culture we live in. Actually, we live in a pagan culture. And here's the thing. People are religious by nature. People have a spiritual hunger. So when you take away belief in God, it doesn't lead to just uh, the absence of religion, but people begin to seek spirituality in various ways. So there's a return to paganism, return to ancient gods and ancient philosophies and ancient uh, lifestyles that actually the kind of lifestyles that are being promoted, sexual promiscuity and so on, goes back to the paganism of the ancient world. In fact, the Canaanites were, were judged and cast out of the land uh, because of their immoral practices. So we live in this culture. How in the world can we have a church in such an environment? It seems impossible. Well, let, let me share with you several responses. First of all, there's the fundamentalist response. And I would like to say this. We as Pentecostals, we're not fundamentalists. Often we're accused in the news media of being a fundamentalist. So let me explain. Fundamental, fundamentalism believes in the basics. So... In one sense, we do believe in the basics of Scripture. The Bible is the Word of God. Uh, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Jesus died for our sins and so on. But fundamentalism refers to a specific movement that started in the early 20th century about the same time as the Pentecostals. Modernism or liberalism was sweeping through the Protestant denominations. And many of the Protestants were denying the virgin birth. They were denying the deity of Christ, denying miracles. And so fundamentalism was a reaction within the Protestant churches to go back to conservative view of Scripture. Well, we have a similar view, but here's the important point. Historically, we were not part of the fundamentalists. The Pentecostals were a revival, and I believe it was a different reaction to liberalism, where the fundamentalists were fighting over um, believing in the scripture, the Pentecostals in essence said, we're not going to be involved in that fight. We are, we're seeking a relationship with God. So we do agree with the fundamental teaching of scripture, but our whole philosophy or attitude is different because we believe in the word and the spirit of equal importance. It's not just a battle over wor the word. It's not just a matter over human reasoning. The fundamentalists in a way... They adopted human reason as supreme, just like the modernists. And they said, we can prove everything by the Bible, but we don't need an experience. Speaking in tongues is of the devil, and you can't have miracles anymore. The days of miracles are over. You serve God strictly by believing in the Bible. So in its own way, it was a reaction. So fundamentalist, um, I believe, is not the right answer because it emphasizes the literal meaning of the word at the Bible, which is a good thing, but it doesn't promote a relationship with God in the power of the Holy Ghost. And so the fundamentalists tend to get isolated. They tend to say, all of you are wrong, and that's why you have fundamentalist type people, you know, you know, uh, picketing and saying, you know, gays are going to hell and, um, you know, people that... Uh, abortionists, they're murderers and going to hell. What good does that do? Even if it's uh, uh, true in a, in a sense, what does it do? What, what, what does it do to further the gospel to attack people? You're, we're not, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came that the world might be saved. 
So we're not coming to condemn people. We're coming to offer a way out. You know, if, if, if you're a sinner and you believe homosexuality is the way you're born, or you believe, well, I had an abortion because I didn't have any choice, it would have messed up my life. What good does it do for someone to come and say, you're an evil person, you're a murderer, you're a pervert, whatever. They didn't just make that choice just out of fun. They felt like they, were, they had no choice. And so if you attack them, you don't help them. But if you say, there is a better way to live, God has a plan for your life. God can forgive you of the bad choices of the past, but God can give you a way out. God can give you a way up. We're on your side. We're your friends. So fundamentalism has the danger of completely rejecting the culture and the danger of becoming irrelevant. Because the average person looking at that can't relate. Okay. The second approach is the liberal approach. Just embrace the culture. Just say, okay, you can, if you're homosexual, not only can you come to church, but you can be the pastor. And so, in a way, that, you know, that accommodates to the culture. But at the risk of, you're no longer even preaching the gospel. So that won't work. The third approach is the charismatic approach. And I don't mean this critically, but there are many people who have received the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. There are many others who have had some kind of experience that they interpret as the Holy Ghost. But the danger of the charismatics, which I alluded to in a way last night, is having experience without doctrine. So the charismatic movement, I think, in its start was a real move of God trying to get into the various denominational churches. But many of those people decided to stay in their churches, or even if they came out and started their own churches, they decided to stay with their doctrines. So you have Catholic charismatics who still will bow down and pray to Mary, who still will confess to the priest, but they're charismatic. And God is tolerant of us in our lack of knowledge, but he does expect us to seek after truth. He does expect us to grow. He does expect us to walk in the light as he is in the light and progressively come into greater and greater understanding, obedience to the word of God. And what's important to understand is when the direction that people are going. If people are going toward truth, Then God is amazingly, if you want to say tolerant, or he is amazingly gracious, I think is a better word, of trying to help people. But when people decide to stop or go backwards or go sideways, then they're in danger of losing the genuine experience that they had. People receive the Holy Ghost even though they don't have fullness of truth. And somebody, some people ask why. Well, the Bible says that God gives the Spirit to lead and guide into all truth. If someone has repents and has simple faith, God will fill them with the Holy Ghost because God is no respecter of persons and God keeps His Word. So even their their doctrine is flawed, they could receive the Holy Ghost. But that is not a seal of approval that their doctrine is perfectly correct or their lifestyle is perfectly correct. That is God's attempt to lead and guide them into all truth. Which means they and we still have responsibility to keep following truth. So the charismatic approach is flawed because it emphasizes experience without doctrine. So it's kind of like um, maybe a flood come of water coming in and it just goes everywhere. Whereas you could take the same volume of water and have it in a river with river banks and it will go from here to the ocean. So just the experience with no form, no shape, no guidelines, no boundaries, no purpose, no motive, is just devastation. It destroys a wide area and ends up going nowhere. But that same water channeled and focused and restricted, if you want to say, confined by the riverbanks, really is not confining it all at all. It's focusing it to reach a destination. Praise God. You know, the train runs on train tracks. 
You could bemoan the fact the train can't go wherever it wants to go. It's restricted to one narrow way. But that one narrow way can bring it across the country and deliver your goods uh, to New York or Chicago. Whereas if you didn't have the tracks, the train's not going anywhere. So the charismatic, and I'm, I'm using this in-house. It's not a blanket condemnation, but I'm just saying that approach of experience without doctrine is not the answer for the 21st century. And then there's the emergent church, which emergent, it's a movement that started within Protestantism to say the Protestants are becoming irrelevant. So how can we reach our culture? How can we reach our generation? So it started with changing style. Let's go to Starbucks instead of Wednesday night Bible study. You know, let's take off our ties and pull our shirt tails out. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have a tie on today, obviously. But they ought to be honest about what they're doing. If you model your whole church service out of, at least it looks like to me, I'm sure it's not, but get out of bed, mess up your hair, pull your shirt tail out, and then have church. I'm sure it's very carefully, expensively done, but it looks like, anyway, you can tell I'm 56 years old. But they ought to be honest in saying they're not reaching the whole world. They are targeting the yuppies. They're targeting the young urban professionals that potentially have lots of money that can help them start a church. They're not targeting the homeless. They're not targeting minorities. They're not uh, uh, targeting senior citizens. They're targeting their little demographic. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that's not superior to everything else. That's not the answer for the world. I mean, the world is diverse. And just going to Starbucks isn't going to help the people of Africa. Going to Starbucks is going to help the, you know, the average people in San Francisco. It appeals to a certain clientele, but that's not the solution. Just playing around with methods doesn't change the problem of the message being lacking. Now, actually... You know, in some ways, I appreciate the emergent movement because it points out the traditional church lacks what the world needs. But the problem with the emergent church, they're thinking if we change the packaging, it will solve the problem. If we change the method, you know, if we have cool websites, if we have interesting services, if we have a lot of dialogue and discussion, and I'm all for those things. But they think that will compensate for a lack of apostolic doctrine and experience. It doesn't. So that's why it's particularly sad to see some of our people imitate that. It's not a matter of them not having a tie or messing up their hair or whatever or using Starbucks. It's a matter of, wait a minute, we actually have what is missing in these traditional churches. We have what is relevant to our culture. So the solution is not in the packaging. So what I see the emergence, and they also, on these key cultural issues, such as, and I use the example of homosexuality, because that's, that kind of shows you how churches handle current cultural crises or current cultural challenges. So the emergent church basically says, well, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to leave that up to God, whether homosexuality is a sin or not, that we won't deal with that. that that's just between you and God. Or they'll even go so far as to say, well, maybe we need to reinterpret Scripture or maybe, you know, the Scripture in its ancient culture, you know, doesn't really apply to modern culture. So essentially what you see is the emergents are accommodating to postmodernism. The liberals accommodated to modernism. The, the emergents are accommodating to postmodernism. In other words, every way is right, but we think our way is just a little bit better. Try us out. Okay, that's not the answer. To me, the answer is to be apostolic. And I talked about what that meant last night, and we'll talk a little bit more about it today. But we have what the world needs. Because human nature does not change. Culture changes, but human nature does not change. People are still struggling with sin. They struggle with relationships. They struggle with addictions. 
They have needs. They have physical illnesses, emotional illness. Uh, people need deliverance from sin and habits of sin. They need deliverance from satanic oppression and attack. So that's true in every culture. Even in a very tolerant, postmodern environment, you do not eliminate the evils of sin. And so if we can preach there is deliverance, you can be forgiven of your past sin. Your guilt can be taken away. You can be healed in your body. You can be healed in your mind. We are facing a broken generation where people are coming from broken homes. I mean, sad to say, for the last 50 years, we've done a massive social experiment. What if you destroy the traditional family? What are the results? Now, we talk about poverty in this country, and it's a big political issue of how, mu- how many programs to help the poor and how much money to spend and how much money to take from the rich to help the poor. And I don't want to make a political statement except to say this. Statistics have shown, you do some research, almost all poverty in America is associated with single-parent homes. If we were really serious about eliminating poverty in America, we would strengthen families. But we've made a decision as a society that we want people to choose whatever lifestyle they want without regard to morality. That's non-negotiable. Okay? If we're really serious, sure, I think we ought to help kids that are born in poverty and don't have health insurance and so on. But if the parents are not responsible, I think there ought to be some conditions. If society is going to help, okay, society is going to impose some conditions, not just to enable you to continue to make those choices. But the way we're doing it now, we reward people for immoral choices and we're paying for it. So what we've decided as a society... We don't want to say divorce is a poor option in most cases. We don't want to say having sex outside of marriage is a bad option with bad consequences. We don't want to promote fathers living with the the um, the mothers of their children in marriage. We don't want to have any moral judgment. So therefore, what we have said, you can choose whatever moral choices you want and we will pay the consequences for you. So we will pay for your abortion. We will even pay for your contraceptives. We will pay for your child uh, that you don't pay for. We will support your child for you. Please go ahead and make whatever immoral choices you want. And since we don't want to say anything is right and wrong, we as a society will pay for whatever consequences. On the theory that every choice is equal. But every choice is not equal. As a society, as I said, almost all of poverty is because of bad choices. Now, now I understand some people are divorced because of sin on, on another person's part. and We support the single mom who's trying to raise her kids and all that. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about as a society, we should be sending a signal that some choices are better than other choices. That God's plan for marriage and family is not just an opinion, but that is truth. And when you structure your society that way, you see positive results, as we have seen in America for 200 years. When you see, when you go against God's choices, you see the results of that, as we've seen in America for the last 50 years. Now, we can't restructure society, but I'm just talking about what the apostolics have a message, not of condemnation. But a message of saying God has a plan and a purpose. And no matter what choices you made in the past, when you come to God, if you'll start making choices God's way, your life is going to improve. Your economic status will improve. Your family relationships will improve. Your physical health will improve. When you start making choices, it does make a difference which choice you make. There are some choices that are right and some that are wrong. There are some that are better and some that are worse. There are some that have consequences in this life and that have consequences in the life to come. We're the ones being honest with you. We're the ones telling you there is a right and wrong. And if if you pursue pursue the wrong path, you're just going to hurt yourself. We're the only ones honest enough to tell you the truth that you don't want to hear. 
But with the truth, we have a remedy. We're like the doctor that says, you've got high blood pressure, but if you'll change your diet, you can be delivered. We're like the doctor that says, you've got cancer, but if you'll have surgery, you can be restored to health. We're the people that are telling you the truth that will save your soul. Hallelujah. So, we have the message. We have the answer. And I alluded to this last night, but this is the time for apostolics to really be apostolics. When Christianity started, it started a Jewish culture that was supportive of biblical truth, but expanded into a pagan culture where people didn't believe in truth. Pretty much like the 21st century. I mean, when Paul started a church in Corinth... In the church, people are getting drunk at the communion service and the fellowship after church. They were getting drunk. That's how pagan they were. They had a guy in church. They were using him in some leadership capacity. I don't know exactly what, but they were using him as at least one of the brothers of the church. And he was committing incest with his father's wife. And they were just welcome. Hey, brother, so-and-so, good to see you. Would you testify today? Would you take up the offering today? And Paul said, you can't allow that. If he calls himself a member of your church and he's going to live in that kind of gross sin, even the pagans know that's a bad thing. You've got to kick him out of the church so his soul can be saved. If he won't repent, you're going to have to put him out. Because he's lying and deceiving and he's bearing a false witness. So they they were in such a pagan situation. Some thought the resurrection had already taken place. So you can't get a, 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 a more secular pagan lifestyle than the city of Corinth. And it affected the church. But in the midst of that, the apostles established strong, growing churches that have given us what we have today. So if the apostles could do that in the pagan world of the first century... Where all kinds of immorality, homosexuality, not only abortion, but infanticide were the norm. If they didn't want a baby girl, they just left it outside in the snow until it died. That was accepted social custom. I mean, we're getting close to that now. We haven't gotten quite there yet. But with partial birth abortion and so forth, we're we're very close. Actually, there is a, a professor at Princeton University, Peter Singer, that says... I think it's four days. We should not declare a baby to be human until four days after birth. That way, if there's some problem that we didn't know about, and we would have aborted them if we'd have known, but if we didn't know about it, then we can just go ahead and kill them in the first four days. They're not considered human. It's not considered murder. We're getting close. And they... So here's the point. If the apostles could prevail and establish the church in the first century... We can establish a church in the 21st century. (laughs) Not by compromising our identity, but by having a balance of the Word and the Spirit. We've got to stick to the apostolic doctrine, but we have to have a genuine move of the Holy Ghost. So that when people come into the atmosphere of worship, they feel something they never felt before. When people come to the altar to pray. They experience something they never experienced before. When people hear the anointed preaching of the Word, it's more than an intellectual argument. It penetrates their heart and it does something to them. Now, we Pentecostals have a distinct advantage in our postmodern culture. As I said, our postmodern culture doesn't value truth. So if you go to a postmodern person that says, the Bible says this, their answer is, so what? Well, the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. Well, okay, the Bible's an ancient book, so maybe it does, but so what? What difference does that make? Well, if you're a fundamentalist, that your whole identity is on defending the Word, you're kind of stuck at that point. Because they don't accept the authority. So where do you go? You know, the Bible says you should be baptized in Jesus' name. Okay, okay, I accept that. So what? doesn't mean anything for me. That means those guys 2,000 years ago baptized in Jesus' name. Okay, they did. Fine. So you're stuck. But what postmodernism does value is personal experience. Have you ever ever noticed this? And I try to read quite a bit and check the Internet to see what's going on. 
but these radio and TV talk shows that it's so popular for people to come on and tell their personal experience and life stories. And some of the things they will say, I wouldn't want anybody in the world to know. And they're telling the whole world of all their sins. It's ridiculous. But people relate to that. People want to hear a testimony. And they will believe it. So if you go up to someone, if you're talking with someone, you say, well, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. So what? Their eyes glaze over. But if you say, I went to church and I had this problem. I had this diagnosis from the doctor. I was hooked on drugs. I was addicted to alcohol like you are. And God delivered me. They say, really? Tell me what happened. They won't look at you in the eye and say, you're a liar. They're going to look at you in the eye and say, tell me more about that. Because that's what our culture accepts. It accepts a personal testimony. We have an experience with God. We have a personal testimony. Therefore, we are not at the mercy of anyone. We've got what the world needs. If somebody's willing to believe the Bible, show it in the Bible. If somebody doesn't believe the Bible, show it in your own life. And then say, the reason why I believe the Bible is what I experience is in the Word of God. Praise God. So we need to highlight both the Word and the Spirit. We need to highlight personal experience and personal testimony. I will say this. We need to be willing to change traditions and methods. You already understand. I spent all last night. We're not willing to change our doctrine. And when I say doctrine, I mean that includes our lifestyle of holiness. The principles of holiness are not just, quote, church standards. They are principles of God's Word. They're teaching. Therefore, they're doctrine. I don't agree with the person says, well, I still believe the doctrine. I just don't believe the standards. Wait a minute. If it's the Word of God, it should be taught. If it's taught, it's doctrine. Now, we might have differences of opinion on certain applications. That's understandable. But when it comes to the principles, we have agreement and we've got to keep. And let me just say this. If you just teach principles but never give applications, you will lose the principles. People don't live in the abstract. They live in the concrete. If you say, be modest, and that's all you ever say, everybody will say, yes, I'm that way. But you have to say, wait a minute. What you think of as modesty, what the culture thinks of as modesty, and what the Bible is speaking of as modesty may not be exactly the same. I mean, if you say, live a moral life, then these two young people that are living together without marriage, they say, well, we're moral. We're committed to each other. That's moral. So as long as you just deal with generalities, everybody will agree. Don't gossip. Everybody says, yeah, that's right. We shouldn't gossip. But you say, wait a minute. Even if you know something secret that's true about somebody, don't go telling people that don't need to know. Because maybe they're trying to repent. Maybe somebody's dealing with them. So if you need to go to the one in authority, that's fine. But don't go telling a hundred people. Don't go telling your thousand best friends on Facebook what somebody did in secret. That's tail bearing. See, so when you get practical, then a light dawns on me. Oh, okay, I need to obey some things. All right. So anyway, getting back to this, we're not willing to change our doctrine. We're not willing to change our way of life. But we should be willing to change our methods and our approach. Now, 50 years ago, there was a song in the hymnal called the Royal Telephone. You're talk, talking to the Lord on the royal telephone. I haven't heard that lately. When I was growing up, one of the best courses to get people to worship, Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. I'm not sure what a main line is today. I'm not sure Jesus should be on it. It doesn't even make sense in our culture. And somebody says, well, if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. I don't know if the Apostle Paul sang Jesus on the main line. I don't know what the royal telephone would be translated into Greek, New Testament Greek. So sometimes we glorify our methods 
And especially when we got into church, we tend to define what's really good as the time we got in church. So the style of music then touches our heart in a way that nothing else can quite do because that is associated with our coming to God. But to the newer generation, it just leaves them untouched. And likewise, some songs of the new generation leave me untouched. I like the new songs. Somebody said, you know, Brother Tenney said, uh, seven eleven songs, seven words, eleven times. I said, well, the new trend is a thousand words one time. <laughs> some songs are so, I, I can't get all the words in and I can never memorize that many words. So every generation has its own style. But we have to be willing to be flexible. Here's the point. Let's say, and and Ethan's here, let's say we go to China and we're going to have service. Well, you're not going to expect to have an American-style church. You're not going to expect to go out and eat American-style food. You're not going to expect to preach English and everybody... Um, understand it. You're not expected to sing one of our courses here in English and everybody relate to it. What you expect to do is work through Chinese culture, Chinese language, Chinese style of food, Chinese style of doing things, because you are a missionary to that culture. Well, here's what we need to understand. We are missionaries to North American culture. Now, we don't have to compromise our identity, but If you're going to reach secular Americans, if you're going to reach young Americans, don't try to convince them that Jesus on the main line is a good song and you need to like it. And unless you like it, you're not apostolic. But be willing to sing their song in their culture, but with apostolic meaning. So that does mean we have to be multicultural and multigenerational. Even in our church services, there might be some elements that one person prefers, another person doesn't. But the goal is not just to come and make us all feel good. If you want to go feel good and you're of my generation, go home and listen to your cassettes or your 8-track if you still have it. (laughs) Or your record player. (coughs) Or go on the internet and find one of those old songs and download them. But when you come to church, it's not primarily about your feeling good. It's primarily about worshiping God and also reaching the lost. So if you have a diverse culture, a diverse society, multiracial, multicultural, multigenerational, you want the church to reflect that. So you want young people to get excited about the church. Even though some elements don't mean anything to you, they mean something to them. When you have a potluck dinner, you might have Korean food that doesn't mean anything to you, but it means a lot to the Koreans. So you try to involve the diversity because you are a missionary to your culture. If we can transform our thinking, we're not just here to get fat and happy and feel good. We're here for a purpose. When the preacher preaches, it's just not to tickle my ears. He's trying to reach a soul. There's a soul hanging in the balance. So I'm not going to sit back and judge. Well, I didn't like that story. Well, I didn't like that thing. No, you're there to say, okay, go get them, preacher. We're going to see what God wants to do. We're looking for a miracle today. We're looking for someone to receive the Holy Ghost. I'm in here with you. It doesn't matter what I like. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters that I reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. So, think of it this way. A first century church in the 21st century. We're trying to take the timeless gospel of Jesus Christ and to put it into terms that a 21st century person can understand and relate. And we have the essential ingredients. Because human nature doesn't change, the gospel is designed to meet the needs of human beings. It's not a superficial packaging to reach a certain culture, but it reaches the deep needs of the heart. And if we can unleash the power of the gospel. You know, sometimes I think we try to defend the gospel, And so it's like having a tiger in the cage. And uh, the kids come by and poke sticks at it, throw rocks at it, yell names at it, try to rile it up. And we try to chase the kids away. Stop doing that. Don't make the tiger upset. Don't, you know. 
If you really want to defend the tiger, just open the cage. Tiger will defend himself. So I think with the gospel, we try to put all kinds of stuff around the gospel to make it look good, sound good, smell good. You know, if we'll just get ourselves out of the way and just let the gospel go forth, let the word of God go forth, let the spirit of God go forth, the gospel will take care of itself. It will meet the needs of the human heart. Oh, let's stand and I want us to pray and let's worship God. Let's ask God to help us to be more effective. A first century church in the 21st century. Folks, that's in, that's incredible. You just every young preacher and that claims to be Jesus' name ought to hear what we just heard right there.